first was last month um, with the Critical Curatorial Conceptual Practices and Architecture program speaking about Corona Plaza. Um, and now we are welcoming the Urban Design Program who have curated a conversation around the future of Willits Point, Queens. Um, also next month, I'd like to draw your attention on November 28th to a conversation by, put together by the Urban Planning Program on uh, Pier 42, and that will bring together different voices um, about that uh, site, which is on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And so the idea of this, just really quickly, is that um, throughout the year, each department has a chance on the last Monday of every month to put together a conversation of different stakeholders on a site that's been important to their discipline within the past year. Um, so I'd like to thank Petra Kempf, Moji Bartolu, Earl Jackson, and Richard Pluns from the Urban Design Program for putting together this great conversation, which I'm really excited for. Um, and I'll hand it over to Richard uh, now to introduce our panelists. Richard is the director of the Urban Design, Architecture and Urban Design Program and also the Urban Design Lab at the, um, here at GSAP and the Earth Institute. So please welcome Richard Plunz. Okay, thank you. Um, it's hard to compete with Halloween down in the village, <laughs> but uh, there'll still be time for that when we're finished here, I suppose. But anyway, happy Halloween and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's hard to compete with hobgoblins, but we have apparitions at Willits Point, uh, which I thought was a kind of nice theming for the, uh, the questions at hand. Um, just between us, so Gavin asked us to do this last July or something, right? Where's Gavin? <laughs> and, and I said, uh, okay, let's do um, New York by Gary, uh, you know, downtown, the highest residential building in the Western Hemisphere, and uh, <clears throat> that's, you know, that sounded pretty, pretty kind of uh, attractive, Gary branding, you know, density mantra, all that. The problem was real estate development program had already tied up. New York by Gary. So, so then I'm figuring, well, what can we do uh, that's, that's uh, like the flip side of New York by Gary and hence Willits Point, which is also on the edge of the planet, uh, at least planet New York as we know it, um, and as far from condos and Wall Street as you know we could get. So, so that's genesis of that. There was no real um, agenda beyond that, except that from what little I knew of it, um, you know, I think it's uh, probably a very vital issue uh, for New York, let's say in the next 20 or 30 years, the, these kind of sites, which are no longer the obvious uh, Manhattan sites, but really on, on the edge of the city. Uh, so, why will its point? So I'll read a few little lines here and then, and then we can get started with our guests. Um, why will its point? We're supposed to be answering that question tonight in general. I think uh, there's probably pretty deeply divergent views here and uh, um, you know, I'm very appreciative that everybody that we asked to come uh, is finally uh, coming and uh, we can really have an interesting discussion among friends and among people that are, are, are very much concerned about the future of the city. Um, I admit to knowing far less about Willis Point than any of these people. Uh, I do know something about other pieces of the puzzle, uh, for example, which somehow I equate, but I might be uh, wrong. I, for example, again, Guanas Canal, where we worked for quite a few years um, with a Superfund designation last year. Maybe that's the same kind of contested turf in terms of the development future of the city, uh, maybe somewhat similar debate. Uh, so there are these big pieces that are out there in, in the puzzle. Um, compared to Gowanus, I think Willis Point now maybe is a little functioning in a debate at a somewhat higher level. Um, 
uh, but it, it, it is very important, even though it's, 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 uh, it's really on the edge spatially. I think there's a legitimate debate about whether uh, or not its present configuration represents the highest possible use for the site, which is always a question, and you'll hear about some of this history uh, tonight. Um, in many ways, this debate in New York is an old story, like the post-industrial uh, strategy stands for the city of the 20s regional plan and up until today and, of course, continuing. Um, but our subject tonight is really industrial and then post-industrial futures or whatever is the next stage in the production of the city, let's say post-post-industrial, and I hope we can get into some of this um, uh, kind of discussion. I think at stake is the future of the service industry, the famous fire formula, you know, fire uh, finance, insurance, real estate uh, now, um, given the city's new situation and a new global, uh, oh yes, this is uh, Cranes from last week. Um, so there are new internal economic infrastructural demands, jobs, uh, advances, uh, and one important challenge has to do with what will be the precise role of green industry in the next post-industrial phase. And a part of initiatives related to high-end research, will this green industry also engage the pressing, let's say, low end of the jobs and infrastructure question? Um, so I think that's another issue that we could, we could get into. And certainly waste management is, I mean, I think Mayor Bloomberg in his, his um, more, more unguarded moments will consider waste management as one of the huge, huge issues facing this city in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, so my challenge relates to the reality that Willis Point is a model for green in industry in the low end and let's see what can be said about this apart all else and uh, at that point I think we can, we can just begin. And we'll see what subtleties get covered by our guests who are um, in alphabetical order. And then I think we're going to present in the reverse uh, Tom Angotti, who is here, who is the um, uh, a professor at urban planning at uh, Hunter and some time ago was at Columbia uh, in the distant past, I think. But he's author of many books and studies. Uh, probably the latest being New York for Sale, Community Planning Confronts Gro Global Real Estate, and that's MIT Press in 2008. But probably more importantly tonight was a 2006 study called Willis Point Land Use Study, which has a lot of, of uh, maps and documentation in it. Sarah Crean is, where's Sarah? All right. Sarah is, uh, by the way, a graduate of the Urban Planning Program here. Um, and has been for quite a few years involved with, um, as former de deputy director of the New York Industrial Retention Network and executive director of the Garmin Industry Development Corporation, which is a, an interesting uh, initiative relative to, of course, the, the Garmin Industry area on the, on the, the west side. <coughs> Neil Kettridge, is, Neil, Neil is here. Uh, architect, urban designer, uh, head of urban design and planning at Bayer Blinder Bell. And um, I'm not sure, we'll hear more from Neil about this, but he has worked on the latest RFP for the, the uh, Willis Point site redevelopment, as far as I know. Um, and finally, Thomas McKnight, who is here, is an uh, urban planner by training, uh, executive Vice President, Co-Manager of the Planning, Development, and Maritime Department of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And of course, he's been involved with uh, Willis Point planning initiatives for at least several years, I think. So that's, uh, that's it, let's just get started. So first is Thomas, then Neil, then Tom, and then Sarah, and then I think we'll hear from everybody and then we'll kind of open things up hopefully for an interesting, uh, uh, no, you can come here, but I'm going to take the water. Mm -hmm.
cooperative. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Columbia for organizing this and for inviting us tonight. I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the plan for Willits Point and try to hit on th all the big issues that relate to the project. And uh, then I'll hand off to Neil to get into finer grain to talk about urban design and some of the architectural and planning thinking uh, that went into the current plan. So just first, I'm sure knowledge of the site and the area uh, amongst yourselves is probably varied. I'll, uh, I'll try to cover the basics uh, and talk about why this has been uh, such a critical site through the ages and also one that has been very difficult to kind of bring the pieces together for a successful project. Um, and really up until now, uh, there, there hasn't really been success in defining a plan and advancing that plan. And it really goes back to the, the site itself and its location uh, within the borough and the region. Um, I would say first and foremost, from a, from a transportation aspect, uh, it is a critically located site. You see it there. Um, you can see the aerial. It's about 60 acres. It's accessible by the 7 train, by the Long Island Railroad. It's proximate to LaGuardia Airport. It is totally surrounded by uh, major highways, uh, allowing easy access into and out of the district. It's just across the Flushing River from downtown Flushing, which has experienced uh, growth, uh, a lot of growth uh, recently. It is uh, in walking distance to all the amenities located in uh, Flushing Corona Park, City Field across the street. You can see the USTA farther down. Um, it's really a critically located site, and I think despite um, impressions, it, uh, it, is a, it is a site that is also uh, fairly proximate to Manhattan. Uh, by train, you're, you're in Midtown in you know, 20, 25 minutes, even better on the Long Island Railroad. Kind of honing in a little bit in more detail, um, you can see the, uh, you can see the, uh, get a sense of the district as it stands today. Um, it is uh, very heavy industrial. It is predominantly automotive, particularly on the western side of the district. Uh, the street between um, the stadium and the district is 126th Street, and your automotive uses uh, are generally centered uh, or, or along that, uh, that thoroughfare. And then as you go to the east, you can see that the, the uh, industrial facilities get larger. They tend to be uh, different uh, and less auto-oriented uh, as you go more towards the east. And you can see, get a sense of the conditions as they stand today. Uh, this gives you a view kind of looking east that's flushing in the distance and more up close. Uh, the Willits Point District, you can see the automotive nature of the area. Um, the, to get a little bit to the, the issues and why this has been such a, a puzzle for um, different administrations to to put together, I want to touch on three things that uh, that's, that really have guided and, um, and and forced us to look at the project in certain ways. Uh, one of them is environmental. Um, over time, the area has become increasingly automotive. Since about the 1950s, there became a greater automotive presence here, um, and also the the conditions. Uh, are fairly rough. And as a result, um, there have been environmental spills. There are environmental issues here. Uh, there is remediation required here. And the remediation required is site-wide. Uh, the second issue, and uh, you can get a sense from uh, some of the ponding here, is that uh, there is little to no infrastructure. There is an undersized stormwater system there is no sanitary sewers in the area. Um, there are a few pockets around the city that don't have sanitary sewers. Uh, this is one of them. And, uh, and, and the investment here in order to make those improvements is very significant. The last point I would note is um, that the area is within uh, the FEMA floodplain, depending on where you are in the site. Um, it, is, it, can, it goes from uh, to zero to negative six uh, in 
terms of floodplain. So for any, re any redevelopment, a comprehensive redevelopment involves raising portions of the site out of the floodplain. This gives you just a little bit more of an up close sense of some of the flooding issues, some of the infrastructure issues, um, some of the roadway issues, and it also gives you a sense of the, the types of businesses that are there today. So as, as I noted, this is a, this is a site that um, administrations have looked at uh, for a long time, um, dating back to Robert Moses. He made a couple attempts on this site uh, to redevelop it, develop it in a comprehensive way. Uh, more recently, various administrations have looked at it. Um, dating back to 2004, there was a planning effort uh, undertaken that looked mostly at downtown Flushing, but it also uh, acknowledged that the future of, of downtown Flushing is really dependent on what happens across the Flushing River in Willits Point. And it laid out some broad guidelines uh, that the framework sought to achieve for, for Willits Point. And that was really the beginning of the process that led us here uh, where we are today. And we have been very successful. Um, you know, th this is a major initiative. Major initiatives take time, um, but we're at a very good place right now um, and with real strong signs of a, a project in the near future. Um, we went through, we decided that uh, early on that um, because of the scale of the project and because it was critical that this be a city redevelopment plan, that it not be a private redevelopment plan. It will be a redevelopment plan that will be implemented uh, by private parties, but it is a city plan. And as a result, with that in mind, we went through all the city's approvals process, uh, doing environmental review, the environmental impact statement, going through all, through ULERP and all the approvals process, which we included in uh, November 2008, prior to selecting a developer. And we're just in that de developer selection process now. Uh, near unanimous approval from the council at the end of 08. We followed that up um, about a year later uh, with the issuance of a request for qualifications, kind of a surveying of the development community to get a sense of where interest was in what was a difficult economic period of um, getting a sense of who's interested and who they are and what they would bring to the table for re redevelopment of Willits Point. We got a very good response to that. Um, and most recently, on September, early September, we received responses for, to our request for proposals for the development of phase one. Uh, we'll be starting with the infrastructure work uh, related to, first and foremost, the sewers that I referenced in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'll talk also about acquisition. This is private property, or it, it was before we entered the development process. We now, for the first phase that I'll show, we control about 90% of that property. Um, we've also been conscious through this process that um, there is, a, there is a, a community today. There is a, a, an industrial, automotive-focused community. So that means that we need to be responsive both towards assisting businesses in their relocation, but also providing assistance to the existing workers. And as part of that, uh, we, we rolled out as part of the plan a, uh, a worker education and training program that's run by LaGuardia, Pro, La, LaGuardia Community College. Get back to those kind of overarching themes that, um, that have guided us through this process. Uh, I think I touched on the first point. Um, this is kind of a... Um, you know, this is, the, this is a, a classic urban planning initiative. Um, it is a, uh, you know, right out of the books pro project of cr taking a problem site and trying to create economic development out of it in a way that, um, that, uh, that is sensitive to the existing community and also will bring jobs and economic development to Queens. It is focused on cleaning up what is a um, significantly contaminated area which will then have ripple effects in nearby waterways. It's about trying to create a development that will be able to link into Flushing to the east, Corona to the west, and it is about creating a new destination uh, to recapture a lot of the, the billions in, in uh, spending that we lose to the, 
to the suburbs uh, in retail spending. And then along the way, of course, creating some very significant jobs for the city. This is the overall development plan. It it amounts to about 9 million square feet of development. Um, but the overarching uh, themes, I would say, and Neil will get into this deeper, is you could think about the western portion of the district as really um, commercial retail destination. And then as you go more to the east, the concept is more residential, more neighborhood. And then you can see uh, the north end of the site is visioned as a uh, convention center. I mentioned that we went through the approvals process uh, in advance of now the developer selection process. And this is uh, something that we worked on closely with Neil's firm. Um, but we established uh, through, the, uh, through the zoning a special district that really seeks to custom tailor the zoning for this specific area. Um, and it, it's unique in that it also guides the, uh, the, the types and look of the streets, street dimensions, urban design. Um, it really seeks to take an area-wide view on zoning and ensure that the entire district is thought of as a, a comprehensive plan. This is phase one. Um, as, as the economy uh, in New York was shifting, uh, we recognized, as a lot of other development plans recognized, that in order to be successful, we needed to start with what would be a significant first phase, but one that would really, that could be doable in uh, a challenging economic time, but one that would also set the stage for future development phases. And that's what you see here. It's the development of the first four blocks with a maximum development of about 1.3 million square feet. Uh, you can see the program here. And also as part of that first phase, we would establish a buffer around the first phase. So what you see here is about 12, 13 acres of development and about another 10 acres of buffer. Uh, that'll sort of create a little bit of breathing room between the new development and the existing industrial uses to the east. You can see some images here that Neil will pick up, pick up on. So touching on the RFP, I mentioned we received responses uh, about two months ago, a month and a half ago. Um, we were very pleased with the response. We received numerous responses for the phase one plan. Um, what we required in the, in the RFP were the detailed plans and financials for the first phase of development. We also required that respondents present their vision for the full development. The first, the RFP related to phase one, but as I noted, it's critical that that phase one fit into what will be uh, a full development plan. And then also, because we're looking to the developer to construct a lot of the infrastructure uh, located within the property, they also need to present a full infrastructure plan. As part of the RFP, um, a uh, design guidelines document was prepared and included uh, that guides development both for the respondents to the RFP, but going forward, it kind of becomes the manual for developers as the project gets built out. And um, you can see the themes here. One in particular was sustainability, um, which is an important part of the project that Neil will touch on also. As I noted, um, you know, there's an existing community here. There's an existing industrial district. Um, and we've been very sensitive to that. Um, we, we did, when we went through the approvals process, got the ability to use condemnation. We haven't done that yet. Um, we've been very successful in reaching negotiated agreements uh, with owners. Our focus right now is on the phase one that I showed you, and we're at about 90% um, in the phase one area, and we're continuing to work on negotiated acquisitions. Business relocation, um, the larger scale relocation associated with the project, we haven't started yet. Um, we're going to be doing that after we select a developer early next year. Um, but we, we were able to, um, uh, we, were, we were able to enter into successful relocation agreements for a first handful of businesses. Um, and they will be relocating to nearby College Point. And right now we're, we're preparing the, uh, the benefits and assistance that's gonna be provided to businesses to help them relocate when we're ready to take that step. 
I touched on the workforce program. This gives you just a little bit of a, a more detailed sense of uh, the program. It, uh, it is innovative. Uh, it is kind of the first of its kind in a lot of ways. Uh, we felt that it was important to be uh, as inclusive as we could be uh, to encourage current workers to take advantage of the training. It, uh, it doesn't require them to give up their jobs or take any other steps. It's really providing um, a tool to either through education, skills training, immigration counseling um, to the existing Willis workforce. And the response has been very positive. And you can see uh, we've gotten about 420 participants uh, have been through at least one of the services offered. And right now we have about 100 enrolled. And that program is going to continue. A little bit more detail on infrastructure. I mentioned that the city would be starting infrastructure projects this fall. Um, this is the menu of infrastructure that we will be completing that will both serve phase one as well as serve additional phases. Um, and the menu on your left is uh, first and foremost the sanitary sewer that's indicated in dark blue that'll link the district over to the nearest pump station which is over in Corona. That's all um, below grade work that we're uh, preparing to start. Um, the storm sewer work and the water main work runs north south on 126th Street. And again, that's to bring the services that are necessary for redevelopment of the first phase and will also support future phases. Uh, the last piece of the infrastructure shown there in pink at the bottom, uh, that's a piece of work that we're gonna be starting a little bit farther once the phase one development begins. Uh, there is a very large uh, water main underneath Willis Point Boulevard, which runs diagonally uh, to the northeast in the district. And because of the, uh, the floodplain issues that I mentioned, uh, the, the water main needs to be raised uh, in, or in connection with the raising of the entire site. Uh, the, the main cannot withstand putting additional fill on top of it to allow for raising the grade. Uh, it needs to be raised um, and relocated slightly to accommodate the development at a new grade. The last piece on infrastructure is uh, the Van Wyck ramps. This is uh, not associated with phase one, but it is important part of the, the overall project. Um, when, it, when the project was envisioned, uh, it's a substantial development, uh, as I mentioned, about 9 million square feet. And in order to ensure that uh, vehicular access could uh, get in and out of the site efficiently, um, you know, there's, there's great transit access, but the reality is there also needs to be good auto access. And um, to provide that better, uh, that improved auto, uh, auto access, uh, we're working on plan changes to the Van Wyck that are indicated in the image to the right. Um, this is a, uh, a process that involves multiple uh, layers of government. Um, it is a complex process. Uh, it is one that we're going through now um, at the completion of which uh, we would begin the design process. So just lastly to sum up on where we are, I noted about approvals and where we are in the developer process. Uh, infrastructure, we're going to be starting work and then additional work will remain in design. Uh, acquisition, we have about 10 percent of the properties in phase one left to left to acquire, the workforce program will continue. Um, and then finally, we're looking to really buy, uh, we're as aggressive as we can to uh, select a developer by early 2012 that'll allow us to implement the phase one plan and the full development of the district. That's it, thank you. There we go. Good evening. Happy Halloween, everybody. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank Columbia, thank the organizers, organizers Gavin, Richard, uh, Petra, Earl, uh, everybody who made this happen for uh, inviting myself and our, our fellow, my fellow presenters. Thank you. Um, really appreciate the chance to be here tonight. Um, my name is Neil Kittredge. I'm with Bayer Blinder Bell Architects and Planners, uh, and we've been working with the City of New York, uh, with the Economic Development Corporation, uh, directly with, with Tom and his group, 
um, but also with a, a multitude of city agencies, uh, some of which are shown here. Uh, in particular, the Department of City Planning on the rezoning of this site, uh, Housing Preservation Development, Parks and Rec, and, and with a uh, team of consultants, uh, engineers, specialists, uh, traffic planners, landscape architects, um, supporting this effort. And what our role has been on this project um, at BBB uh, has been to help the city uh, really with three steps in this process that have led to where we are today with the um, uh, RFP to developers recently uh, having received a number of submissions that are, that are under review. First, we developed uh, a, a sort of an overall vision for the site, a uh, master plan, uh, in order to establish what the city's objectives were for urban design on this site. And, um, you know, Richard, I really like the idea of, uh, of apparitions because sometimes urban design is about having visions of what the future may be that aren't quite in focus and are a little fuzzy and ghost-like, and then you, they gradually become more and more real. And I think it's an interesting way of thinking about urban design, actually, um, to talk about it as, as apparitions, as visions, visions of possible futures. Um, after creating this master plan, we worked with the city again uh, to define the rezoning, the rezoning which was passed uh, in 2009, right, 2008. Uh, 2008, through the ULERT process and, a, and a, uh, 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 the typical process that goes through the City Planning Commission and uh, the City Council. So the rezoning has been one of the major rezonings of this administration um, uh, and uh, one of the larger ones. And following that, we developed the design guidelines, which as Tom mentioned, is, will be a manual for how to go about uh, developing this district. And the idea of these is to set certain principles and, and rules and requirements and also opportunities in place, but then allow a great deal of flexibility also so that developers and their architects can bring their creativity to it. And so the idea of defining what you require, what you encourage, where you really want to encourage people to, to bring new layers of creativity and design to it uh, has been one of the major um, aspects of this entire process. Um, Tom showed this slide, uh, but I do want to just say that um, while Willits Point does feel like it's on the edge of, edge of the planet when you're there, and it feels a little bit like you're uh, maybe uh, on the moon when you're in some of these uh, spaces around it that are very isolated by highways and infrastructure. Uh, it is actually, if it weren't for Manhattan being there as a center of gravity, this would be in the very middle of probably one of the most vibrant and dense urban concentrations anywhere in the country. Um, in a way, it's kind of the missing link in this area, which is undergone a lot of development, a lot of transformation over the last 100 years. Um, downtown Flushing is really one of the most significant, important business districts in the outer boroughs. Uh, it's incredibly diverse, it's incredibly vibrant. Uh, it's one of the largest Asian populations in the entire country. Uh, Corona is a major dense residential neighborhood. Uh, we have, so we have these neighborhoods. We have major regional park system of Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, which is a destination for New Yorkers, Queens Botanic Garden. And then we have these actual destinations for both tourism and for New Yorkers and, and a wide range of people like uh, City Field, the Tennis Center, the Aquatic Center, the Queens Museum, all of these things attracting four million people a year. So we have this incredible concentration of both people who live and work, people who visit, people who are coming here for recreation, all around us. And Willits Point is in many ways the missing link and it's been cut off by this infrastructure that only traffic engineers in the 1960s could love that bowl of spaghetti of highways uh, that has really taken over large parts of this area. But you do see in yellow over on the right, major uh, new developments that are happening on the waterfront. Uh, the downtown Flushing is, is really trying to create public access to um, the east side of the Flushing River. There's wetland uh, restorations happening on the west side of the Flushing River. And so Willits Point is gradually getting connected into its surroundings despite the barriers that exist there. And one thing that you can see on this map is this red um, passerelle. I don't know if I have a pointer on this, but right where it says LIRR, which connects you from the park across all of these vast railroad yards, then to the number seven subway station, and then directly into City Field. But that's also actually the lifeline for Willits Point. That's the connection that will link the park to the site and up to the marina. And so by developing Willits Point for the first time in decades, there will be a public link all the way from Flushing Meadows Park 
to the actual waterfront uh, that it is very much a part of and yet you can't get there from here today. Um, why is this in the 100-year floodplain? Because it was a floodplain. This site was a salt marsh. Uh, this is an 1844 map uh, showing that this was really part of the Flushing Creek um, marshlands. Uh, but it was very quickly turned into the Valley of Ashes that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about. Uh, the, this was where um, the byproduct of the heating and powering of Manhattan, uh, the coal ash, was dumped for decades, and it was this uh, kind of hellish landscape uh, that, uh, that Fitzgerald wrote about, uh, and he sort of portrayed it as kind of the dark side of the opulence and decadence of Manhattan, uh, you know, the sort of the place where all the kind of waste and, and, um, uh, and, and detritus of the city uh, ended up, um, and, and that formed such a powerful metaphor for the book. But you can see here how much area tur was turned into an ash dump I mean, it was really everything that I just showed you. Um, <clears throat> so that, and I apologize for the low resolution here, but that dystopian kind of space, as often happens you know, in, in um, cities, uh, has been uh, subject to attempts to turn it into a utopia. And the World's Fairs that occurred just to the south of us, this is the 1939 World's Fair, this is the 1964 World's Fair, were really very much an attempt to do that, to design the ideal world of the future uh, and to place it on a 1,200-acre site immediately south of us. And so the Wilts Point site is just on the very, very top where you see some trees next to Shea Stadium, uh, which hopefully some people here remember Shea Stadium still. It's only been a couple of years. Um, and again, you can see that passerelle connection over the rail yards. That was how you got... So in the 1964 World's Fair, Shea Stadium was developed. That connection was made, and the area around Shea Stadium was turned into um, New York City parkland, which considering that it was all parking lots, uh, it sort of, it shows up green on a map and that was really not, not very true. But here you can see it as sort of when we started with Chase Stadium and the new city field actually under construction right next to it. And you can see this, this um, parkland in the distance, the old fairgrounds um, with the, with the uh, unisphere, the globe and that little blue fountain and the link coming all the way back up and over to the, to the waterfront and the marina, uh, which is very, very hard to access today unless you're in a car. Um, and we're surrounded here by these vibrant neighborhoods, by development, by destinations, by activities. Uh, this, this really turns out it's not an edge uh, at all. Uh, it's very much a center. Um, but we have these dramatic conditions of contamination of a high water table because uh, we're, we're basically in, in the water. We're in a salt marsh that was filled in. Uh, that spreads the contamination out into the surrounding waterways and water bodies. Um, we're in the floodplain, of course, and we also just happen to be under the landing uh, cone restrictions of LaGuardia Airport. And so unlike any other part of New York, we have a height restriction that we can't break because it's the Federal Aviation Administration determining how tall buildings can be in this area. And so you can see on the right uh, the kind of the landing cone, and this whole place is kind of defined uh, by that, by that uh, restriction in many ways. And then we have this program that Tom showed, 8.9 million square feet of different activities with 5,000, maybe 550, 500 housing units that may be part of that. Um, if you think about 5,500 housing units or so on 62 acres, it's about 90 units per acre. So just as point of reference, Morningside Heights neighborhood immediately surrounding this campus is 113 units per acre. So it's not that different in density and feel from Morningside Heights. Uh, and that's good, actually, because that will mean that this isn't going to be a, a kind of unlively place, you know, inactive place. This is going to have an, an immensely critical mass of population in order to create a community, really, um, from the ground up. So when we started looking at this, we realized that the combination of that program and the height restrictions on the site uh, mean that we're really talking about maximization of this site as the sort of urban design challenge. And what we ended up with is rather than designing objects in this space, um, it's almost like taking a solid block, a solid mass, and then carving into that, you know, the streets, the open spaces, the parks, uh, the, the promenades and walkways, and using those to make connections and really define your experience of being there. And the idea from the beginning was to try to make this like a part of New York City, a real New York City neighborhood, not something apart or alien, um, but made up of, of the types of spaces that, that make New York great and that make New York work. Um, 
And in these early studies, we really found that we had to confront the reality of this enormous stadium that was being built right next door, which is not this. This is a picture of Ebbets Field in Brooklyn in 1913, of course, uh, that the stadium that City Field was modeled on. And Ebbets Field, of course, was in, it was across from Prospect Park. Uh, it was in a neighborhood. Everybody just walked to the baseball game from their house. My father did that. He lived in Crown Heights. Um, but what we have here is a stadium that looks like Ebbets Field, but it's actually adrift in this kind of vast sea of parking lots. And uh, you can kind of see that the Valley of Ashes F of F. Scott Fitzgerald has turned into the Valley of Asphalt uh, in this area, and, and in its own way uh, is, still, is still a barrier in this, in this vast space, and Willits Point you know, forming the kind of um, eastern edge of that. Um, but the stadium does provide um, a kind of a glimmer, a, st a starting point of urbanity, of urban space, of public space uh, in this area. And so we, we realize that we need to build on that. We need to build up uh, urban form around the stadium and a sense of space and start to enclose it and frame it and, um, and, and work with it. Uh, and at the same time, not make it all about the stadium, but make that sort of one of the starting points, but create kind of a multifaceted neighborhood with a lot of different aspects to it. And so we came to this um, plan, which is an illustration of one possible outcome, because really what we did was uh, develop the zoning framework that became part of the city's zoning code uh, and the design guidelines, which are really a complex set of rules uh, and opportunities and variables that might lead to an outcome that looks like this or might lead to an outcome that looks somewhat different from this and, and allow for uh, the same kind of flexibility and the same kind of um, design opportunities that you would have in, in any New York City neighborhood where you're, um, where you're working with the zoning code and, um, and then designing buildings and open spaces within that framework. So this was more about a set of principles. A big one that Tom mentioned is that the commercial area, which also has housing, so it won't just be a shopping area, but it'll actually be intensively mixed use and have a lot of residents living there closer to the stadium. The residential area surrounding a neighborhood park to the east and a convention center, a small convention center, which um, is a great opportunity for New York City connected to the number seven subway. Um, to the north. Uh, and you know, we thought about while we were doing this, eventually we'd like to see some of these other parcels, these stadium parking lots, the MTA parcels, to kind of enlist those into creating, uh, sort of completing the urban fabric of this, this starting point. Um, but those are, those are subject to you know, what uh, the owners and, and uh, operators of those parcels want to do. And, and I think that the you know, Willits Point itself, the development, is going to lead to the expansion of this interconnection of urban form uh, around it. And what the big opportunity here is to create a neighborhood from scratch, an entire community. Uh, and in so doing, to apply sustainable principles that haven't been done in New York, really, because uh, new development, other than, say, Battery Park City and a few other places, including its infrastructure, its open spaces, its buildings, uh, hasn't really been defined you know, from scratch in the same way. And so this has actually been a pilot project for the LEAD ND, LEAD for Neighborhood Development. Um, the master plan that the city produced uh, has received a stage one certification. The developer will complete the application. And so this is going to be the first LEAD ND project in New York City. Um, and that's really been based on a series of sustainable planning principles, which you can see here. And, uh, and, and so these have been kind of the underlying philosophy of developing the site. Um, the idea that this is highly transit oriented. We want to get people out of their cars. We want to minimize parking, really um, encourage use of the trains, the LIRR, the subway, um, buses, shuttles, jitneys, and bikes, uh, especially other ways of getting around. Um, a connected neighborhood. So it's not just about the site. It's how you get from the site to and from the surrounding areas. And this was a study that we did as part of our work for bike and pedestrian connections. Uh, kind of threading the needle of all of this heavy infrastructure, sneaking underneath expressways um, into uh, ecologically restored areas, um, squeezing in bike lanes and walkways where they don't exist to get people across bridges and, and across uh, pieces of heavy infrastructure that was designed entirely for cars and trains, getting people to and from flushing from Corona from the park, um, and, and really linking this into its surroundings. Uh, and then uh, the third principle of high-density 
um, really making this a critical mass. And here you can see how that played out with the um, FAA height limits. What we really have is we have a cluster of taller buildings, of towers, that the FAA arbitrarily decided should, be, should match the height of the stadium's tallest um, sign and light post, uh, and then an area that's actually under the landing cone uh, in blue, uh, which are lower rise buildings. And so these are very, these are very dense buildings. Uh, they really define and frame space. And thinking about the nature of that space, the nature of those streets and, and public spaces uh, really became a major goal of the urban design guidelines. And so you can hear, see here kind of the impact of that density, um, a really intensive neighborhood um, with high density retail, residential, commercial uses, um, all knit together by a fabric of New York City streets. Um, the other aspect was a really a linked network of green streets and open spaces tying this entire thing together. Um, as part of this project under the zoning, there will be over a thousand new trees planted on streets and in parks. Um, there will be a neighborhood park, maybe in that location, maybe in a slightly different location, but that's accessible to everyone who lives in this entire community uh, no more than one block away in any direction. Um, and those neighborhood streets will incorporate um, uh, green space, even in the smallest ways, in, par in uh, the parking uh, band on a street uh, with the tree canopy. Um, and they'll be very uh, open in the way that the buildings meet the ground. So this is actually the first zoning ordinance in New York that I'm aware of that actually requires that in a residential building, you know, a big building with a garage in it where people might you know, use the elevator, get in their car, drive away, kind of never experience the street, never be part of their community, uh, there's actually a requirement that all of the ground floor apartments in that building each have their own entrance right onto the sidewalk. And that on, on its own, that is going to do so much for turning this into a, a real vibrant community, um, unlike uh, many other places. Um, other sustainability principles are water management, using those green spaces to, to detain and treat stormwater before it goes into the waterways um, so it can be filtered and cleaned. 75% um, of the rooftops will be either green, blue, or white, uh, all of which are um, uh, important sustainability goals in order to achieve the LEED ND rating. Um, you'll never have to walk more than precisely 218 feet before you hit an intersection, uh, again, enhancing the ability to walk around this neighborhood, kids to get to the K through 8 school, which is going to be in this neighborhood, and any resident to get to a wide range of uses. And the phase one, as Tom said, uh, shown here, and what we realized was the, the goal of phase one should be established to establish this fundamental core of the project, this sort of basic relationship with the stadium, with Roosevelt Avenue, with the entrance, uh, and really kind of get the project going uh, with, its, with its focal point. And that involved defining 126th Street, which is going to have two different levels. So it's going to have the existing street below the floodplain and the new frontage of these buildings above the floodplain. And so to do that, uh, we've created a 45 foot wide, 2,000 foot long linear public open space. And this is actually the key connection now from the south to the north, from the regional park of Flushing Meadows Corona to the Flushing Bay Marina waterfront, this linear park moving in a north-south direction, which also forms all the gateways into the interior of the site, very important from the experience of pedestrians coming to and from the subway and creates a kind of a split level public space in front of these buildings which and this range mountain range of towers which would face onto the city field stadium um, and uh, create a sort of a wide setback large area in front of those buildings almost creating an amphitheater like effect in an outdoor room an urban room uh, opposite the city field stadium and and really um, uh, making the most of the way that stadium has been designed to, to frame and create space and define space on 126th Street. So that takes us from the existing condition today with City Field uh, to this concept of Willits Point tomorrow. And um, the final point is that um, you know, many of the goals of this are not to create a mega project, you know, something that looks like it was all designed at once by one hand. And I think the way this will be phased, the way this will be implemented, and we hope uh, it'll be designed by 
multiple architects, multiple designers, and it will start to develop over time that natural organic quality of a true New York City authentic community. So I'll leave it at that and um, pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Hi. Um, I decided to dress up as a Hunter College professor. Um, it's great to be back here again. Um, I think I get invited back once a year or so on, on a regular basis to make trouble. And uh, I got involved with Willits Point uh, oh, back around 2005, 2006 at the instigation of Arturo Sanchez, who is a distinguished uh, graduate of this program and a colleague uh, who was then on the community board, on community board three in uh, Corona uh, in Queens and knew about the Willits Point project and asked uh, and, and got uh, some funding uh, to do a, simply a land use study. Uh, which is the kind of thing that most planners do know how to do. It's a very simple thing. Uh, and I, I just want to share with you some of what we found. From what you heard in the first two presentations, you might get the impression that all that's there is a swamp full of, um, um, of auto uses and uh, pretty run down, pretty much a dump, and uh, there's nobody there. There are no people there. So the first thing we set out to do is to find out who's there, uh, to look at the businesses. We knew that uh, the city's plan was to, and actually this is my first problem with the, with the project, follow the Moses pattern of urban redevelopment. It is to start with a tabula rasa, uh, to uh, basically make invisible what already exists uh, and create uh, wonderful new pictures of uh, the shiny new city on the hill. And this, of course, will be literally on the hill because it'll all be built on some 15, 20 feet of uh, fill. So we went out there and uh, with one of our uh, uh, skilled uh, graduate students, we did a bilingual uh, survey of businesses. Uh, where's, where's the, I'm just gonna scroll. Wow. So how do I scroll with this? Okay, I just wanna scroll through and, and give you some of um, what we found, I'm gonna summarize it in a minute. Um, but we found about, we were told uh, the city at that point was saying there were a few hundred auto-related businesses. Well, we found 1,800. And, uh, 1,800 jobs, I'm sorry. Uh, and hundreds of businesses many of them small and auto-related. We found that uh, most of them had been there for uh, decades. This isn't advancing. Will the keyboard work? Um, we, we did a survey in English and Spanish of the business people and we, um, we came up with a, um, the uh, land use picture which, as was said before, showed that the majority of businesses and land uses were auto related. But when you start picking it apart, you, you see that there are many different kinds of auto-related businesses. And what you have is what economic development experts all over the country are talking about creating, which is a, um, 
a business district in which uh, businesses have strong linkages with one another and support one another. An industrial park in the city, in a way. Uh, it's the kind of thing that most economic development experts haven't known how to create, uh, but which already exists. Uh, so that, that's the prevalence of uh, auto related. And it has multiple owners, which uh, at the time we did the survey, uh, we also looked at the, uh, well, and they're all taxpayers, very little vacant underutilized property, which is the usual premise for using the power of eminent domain. Uh, so it was pretty active. There's very little. Um, unoccupied uh, property, uh, paying taxes, and uh, okay, can we go to the next series of slides? Because I want to show you some pictures that you don't see in the city's um, promotion for its Willis Point, Willis Point study. Yes, there are even some retail businesses that provide services for workers, and um, there's actually one resident. Um, next, oh, I can do this right. Uh, okay, so we found 225 firms. This is the summary of the study. Uh, not 80, which is what the city was claiming at the time. Uh, about 1,400 to 1,800 jobs, which EDC later uh, did, went and did their own survey and found even more than 1,800. 82% are renters, which means they're vulnerable to uh, any type of acquisition program because they have nothing to say uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the project. They're not the property owners. Uh, and we looked, at, um, uh, we looked at the ownership patterns and we, be, we saw that already um, real estate investors uh, and equity firms were moving in and buying up properties, beginning to speculate uh, on the possibility that there would be an urban renewal project. 68% um, of the firms had been in businesses for business for more than five years. Uh, and there was a lot of competition and uh, competitiveness am in, among the businesses. Another attribute you look for in a healthy uh, economic environment. Uh, great diversity. Uh, and it's an entry point for immigrant labor and entrepreneurship. Um, which also helps to explain why the workers there were invisible. Uh, when, we, when we went out, we talked to not just the business owners, who very often were not there, but uh, the people who were working there. And um, uh, uh, they, uh, they th when, then, then we heard that um, uh, EDC, the city was claiming that it was its policy not to talk to workers and not to property owners when it came time to consider eminent domain uh, because they had to talk to the property owners. Now, this is a legalism that prevented uh, the people who make a living there from having a voice in the process of planning and uh, development. Um, now, I just want to show a few more pictures. Okay. So um, uh, there is one unpaved street that is constantly photographed. Um, 
but many of the streets in Willis Point are paved. Uh, they, most of them don't uh, have sewers, but many do. Uh, and they have water, and they have storm sewers. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is another uh, picture that uh, sometimes makes it into, into the uh, stories at Cranes. The Iron Works, there are a few other businesses besides auto-related. Uh, the House of Spices, which is the largest uh, warehouse and factory for Indian foods in the United States. And uh, waste management uh, and recycling operations. So uh, Willis Point is a it's a very, very diverse place, and a lot of people depend on it for their jobs. And uh, in the planning, the people who work there really did not have a great say. Um, there are people who, for reasons of language inaccessibility, uh, were not in the official meetings, did not go to the community boards, which were all held uh, community board sessions that were all held in English. And um, so I just want to summarize what I think are, are four major problems with the project. Uh, the first and most important is from a planning standpoint. Uh, it's, it's the same old traditional urban removal uh, process. Um, the existing community is invisible. Um, it is going to create what we call planner's blight uh, through the abuse of eminent domain. You declare a place to be a slum or um, a, um, a disaster area, and once you do that, you actually begin to make it worse. Uh, now, that process actually began 50 years ago because for 50 years, the businesses have been demanding uh, that uh, sewers be connected and that the city pave the streets. The city did not provide those services precisely because of the interests the redevelopment interests that were standing on the side waiting for Willits Point to go. And uh, the most important and serious injustice in this project is that those businesses, after paying taxes for decades for services that they didn't get, will now find that the new developers, which include the largest development teams in the city, uh, uh, are going to get the benefit from a fully subsidized infrastructure. So uh, how do you like that? You pay taxes for years, you don't get the services, they kick you out, and then the, the new owners come in and they get the services free. Um, okay. The other thing is, from a planning perspective, okay, let's look at um, uh, the location. And much, uh, a great deal is made about the location. It's a destination in between destinations. But it's not a community. How are you going to create a community? It's surrounded on three sides by expressways, and on the other side, by a ball field. And you can talk about connections and accessibility, but uh, there's only way that you're gonna get to Corona and Flushing is in your car. You can create bicycle lanes and bicycle paths, but most trips are not going to be, through, as much as I would love them to be, uh, it, it's not gonna happen. Uh, the environment, okay, the second uh, problem is the environment. And we start here with another planning problem. As was said many times, it's in a floodplain. 
Plan YC 2030, the city's long-term uh, sustainability plan, calls for um, a sustainable future for the city and thinking about the long-term consequences of sea level rise and global warming and doing everything to confront the challenges of global warming. Yet, the, all of the big projects that seem to be coming online are located in floodplains from Coney Island to uh, Willets Point. Is this the most precautionary approach you take to the environment by building in a floodplain and setting the example of uh, uh, building on, um, on landfill uh, and, and um, shouldn't, shouldn't we rather be thinking about uh, taking a precautionary approach? And when the city is the leader in development, the city ought to be in, leading in sustainability. And I don't care how many LEED certified buildings you have, that doesn't get you out of uh, the consequences of sea level rise. Um, it's not transit-oriented development. Uh, have you ever been on the number seven train during peak hour? There's no place on the platforms. It is the, one of the lines that is over capacity already, and the platforms are already designated as overflowing at peak hours. Uh, if it were transit-oriented development, why are there 6,700 parking spaces planned for it? Um, why all this parking? In addition to the parking at Shea State, at, um, at City Field, sorry, um, why, are the, why is there a new parking plan? Well, realistically, from a developer's standpoint, you wouldn't build this without parking because nobody's gonna rely on uh, the number seven train uh, to get in and out. Um, noise. It is, when is the city going to stop building next to expressways, elevated lines with extreme noise, and offering as the only mitigation double pane windows and air conditioning? What kind of uh, urban environment are we creating when uh, we are encouraging new development in areas with excessive noise? Um, third, from the point of view of economic development, as I said, here is an industry concentration with many problems, problems of pollution, problems of uh, dumping in, on, on the streets because, because of lack of regulation. Now, I, I'm a bicycle advocate and a pedestrian advocate, but I have no illusion that people are gonna give up their cars tomorrow. Where will cars be repaired? Wouldn't it be, if you're interested in the long-term future to the year 2030, wouldn't it be interesting to have a plan to create a center for green auto repair and green vehicle development, including research and development, including repair, where you could retrain workers for real jobs, not for hypothetical jobs that they might find in an economy in which there are very few. What about, the, what about those existing businesses that are changing tires and changing oil and everything? Where are they gonna go? This is another Robert Moses redevelopment problem, a lacuna. Where are they gonna go is not even, a, nobody even asked the question. Well, I can tell you where they're gonna go. They're gonna go in, onto the streets in Queens and in Brooklyn and everywhere else because they can't afford to rent anywhere else. And they're gonna change tires and change oil and they're gonna dump in the sewers again. So you really haven't done anything to clean up 
the auto repair industry, you've just displaced it, which is exactly what Robert Moses did. Never did anything to solve the problem of poor housing, uh, lack of jobs, poverty, only uh, created a tabula rasa, a new development, and displaced people uh, to, to the unknown. Um, I have a problem with the first phase if this were a full build, build out, you could make a case that this community is gonna work. But a community with 400 residents, can you call that a fully vibrant community? That's, if you were one of those tenants, you would be driving over to Flushing's and Corona, Flushing and Corona uh, for services because the retail businesses will not be able to provide for you. They will, however, be able to, and the first phase is going to be a bailout for City Field. We know the Mets are in real trouble, uh, financially as well as they can't win a game. So, uh, so this is gonna bail them out by putting a little amusement area next to their stadium. And it's not going to be a community. Uh, people who know development and follow development in New York City know that second and third phases can take decades. Uh, if you wanna bet on it, don't bet that this second phase is gonna happen in the next 20 years. I, it doesn't, it doesn't really add up, especially in these financial times. So what, we, what you have to consider is a first phase that's going to be around for at least 10 or 20 years. How is that going to sustain? Uh, that just doesn't add up. Um, and then I guess the final problem I have is a question of the questions of inequality and ethics are very powerful with this project. Former Borough President Claire Schulman created a nonprofit corporation that got money from the city to promote the development before it was approved. Is there anything wrong with that? That the city pr uh, paying the lobbyists to lobby itself? Well, it, it's not the only case, but it happened with uh, Willits Point. Um, the training is good. Training can't hurt, but the track record of uh, jobs training is not very good, and job placement is very good. It is a second and third choice. Um, if you ask the workers, d what would they rather have, a job or job training? They'll tell you a job. So you're taking their job away from them and you're giving them job training in an economic period when there aren't that many jobs around. Something is grossly inadequate with that scenario. And um, and and something is also wrong with this and a series of other projects that use significant public subsidies to promote private development. Uh, this was posed as a public development, but if you look at the process of developer selection, it really follows the, the public-private partnership model in which the private sector plays the leading role. A request for expression of interest is a dialogue between the mayor's office, EDC, and the development community in which they can determine their, wh where their mutual interests lie. Uh, 
the, the business owners and the workers are not involved in that process. Um, the, uh, the RFP goes out and anybody can answer it, but in order to answer it, you must have the qualifications of an experienced large-scale developer. So even though there may be individual architects to execute individual buildings, um, they're going to be, this is putting development in the hands of developers who are experienced at doing large-scale developments. Uh, I take offense at um, the pretty pictures that claim we're going to have the dream of Jane Jacobs, a an urban environment with uh, multiple scales, uh, growing incrementally, um, uh, green and healthy, because it's not exactly the opposite of what Jane Jacobs talked about. She fought the Moses process, planning process and planning results exactly for those reasons, that it is a destroyer of the urban environment and does not begin with what already exists, but begins by wiping the slate clean and displacing people. Thank you. It's always difficult to be the last act. Um, I just have some comments that I'd like to make. I don't have a slide presentation, um, but I hope my comments are, can be useful because I just want to talk a little bit about what has happened to New York City's industrial sector overall uh, over the last 10, 15 years. And hopefully that can be a, a useful re uh, reference point as you're talking about a community like Willits Point, which has very specific physical issues and even its industrial issues are kind of unique because it's more heavy industry. Um, but I think a little bit of the tale of the industrial sector in New York uh, might be a useful point of background. And I worked in the industrial development and retention uh, field for the last 12 years, um, both as a policy advocate uh, looking at proposed rezonings and other city and state policies that would affect the manufacturing sector uh, and working with the local manufacturing community to try to develop responses. But I also worked in business services. So I worked with companies that were trying to expand, trying to move, trying to cut costs, trying to hire people and got a sense of what their situation was. Um, I think that the one thing to think about when you're looking at Willits Point is it's within uh, a city that actually has a tremendously rich uh, industrial uh, uh, history, but also an incredibly rich level of activity even today. And the neighborhoods that I worked in over the last tw 12 years all speak to that, whether you're talking about the Garmin Center, the, the uh, apparel manufacturing in Chinatown, whether you're looking at Sunset Park in Brooklyn, whether you're talking about Long Island City in Queens, which has actually been um, home to both apparel manufacturing, food manufacturing, components manufacturing. Uh, you look at the printing industry, which occupied big parts of Manhattan and then relocated to Long Island City. You look at food manufacturing that is taking place in the South Bronx. Uh, you look at a cluster such as in North Brooklyn where you have um, furniture, um, and architectural detail manufacturing all over North Brooklyn and, and also in Bushwick. Um, and I'm just mentioning a few of the um, industrial uh, clusters that still exist in New York um, and that contribute a lot. Um, when I came into this field in 1999 after I finished at Columbia, there were about 250,000 people working in light manufacturing in New York City. Um, a quarter of a million people were involved. And what I witnessed over the last 10, 12 years has been um, impressive. 
Um, and I have seen many of these rezonings uh, take place during that period and the impact of, of those rezonings. Um, but I just want to say a couple things about the industrial sector. Uh, one thing that really struck me after spending more and more time in industrial communities all over New York, um, every borough except Staten Island, was that they have tremendous ties to the local economy. And they're not insignificant, especially when you think about what's happening with the economy today. Um, the ties are obviously to their workers who mainly live close by. The ties are there to, to their suppliers who are also usually in the area, even to the delivery people that work for them, to the businesses that actually feed or provide other services to their workers. So they're embedded within the local economy. They're part of all of these local micro economies. Um, the other thing that uh, I think that's, that's interesting about um, the industrial sector in New York City is, is that it's not monochromatic. We're not talking about one product. Uh, we're talking about an industrial sector that reflects the diversity of the population in New York, the diversity of the interests, um, but also the complexity, actually, of New York City's local economy, which is often not visible when you're walking around the city and you're seeing kind of the standard retail that we usually see today. Um, we have a tremendously complicated local economy and we have complicated customer bases um, and very specialized needs. And the local manufacturers that are in New York City today are serving local fashion designers. They're serving local restaurants. They're serving uh, furniture designers, architects, the construction industry, other sectors of the economy, even film and television, that need local services. Um, and one of the last projects that I worked on was actually looking at markets for prototype development and product development services that manufacturers would provide to local designers, which is actually a market that really could be expanded in New York City. So when you're thinking about Willett's Point and we're talking about this industrial area as one of many of a cluster of industrial communities all over New York, even with all of the losses um, that we've seen, because the, when I talked about the 250,000 jobs that were in New York City when I started in 99, that number has been cut in half easily. Um, but you're still talking about something that, especially in 2011, uh, is relevant. And the industrial discussion is interesting, I think, for four basic reasons. One is the jobs. There's very little coherence today about how we're going to create jobs. Um, and the jobs that are being created, whether in New York City, the state, the country, they are often not of good quality in terms of wages and benefits. And the city's numbers show that industrial jobs tend to pay better. Um, and that's very, very important, uh, especially in the context of 2011. The question of a diverse economy, which I thought was going to get tossed out four or five years ago as passe, but when you look at what has happened to New York and to the country when we've been tied into one or two key industries, when you look at the havoc that that's wreaked, um, the question of having an economy that's resilient uh, and that can weather what is taking place, where you have all of these individual little businesses that are actually little engines. They're all creating jobs, and they're all tied into other little businesses that are also trying to create jobs. That's another issue. Then there's the question of sustainability, which is on many people's minds, and the question of having products uh, that are produced close to market and minimizing the impact of transportation. And finally, the question of public health, uh, which is an issue both from the perspective of the workers who are making the products and how they're treated, and also the processes that go into the production of goods, and how that impacts all of us as we consume those goods. Um, so I think all of this is it's kind of, it's a frame of reference as you think about a very um, challenging urban planning project, um, to say the least. And, you know, even today, just think about it, there are about 6,000 manufacturing companies all over New York um, continuing basically to fight it out and to produce goods and to produce services for other sectors of the New York City economy. Going forward, one thing I just want to talk about that's relevant to the industrial community is politics. Um, and we've talked about the city, but, um, you know, we have about two years left of the Bloomberg administration. Um, 
And I think from a land use perspective, uh, from the industrial community's perspective, uh, the administration has had a negative impact on the industrial sector overall, across all five boroughs. I don't think that from the industrial community's perspective there's an argument on that. Uh, over 23 million square feet of industrial space were lost due to rezonings between 2001 and 2008. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's been a tremendous loss of both jobs and firms in New York City during that period. Now, not all of that can be attributed to rezonings. Um, because I, as I mentioned, I worked in business services. There are manufacturing companies that are not viable and that should not be in business anymore. Land use is one part of the equation, but it's a very significant part of the equation because, um, as Tom mentioned, most of these people are renters. So they're subject to the whims of the market. I think that the administration, um, and based on what I saw over the last 12 years, it's also missed an opportunity, which is a really major opportunity to be a champion for small businesses, for industrial businesses, for manufacturing businesses. And that might have seemed kind of trite and laughable three or four years ago, but when we're talking about what's happening with the economy now, particularly um, how uh, the outer boroughs are being affected in terms of job loss, it seems to have um, more resonance. Um, a couple things that I, I just want to say about city policy that I saw over my last 12 years. Um, one thing that might be relevant to this question is um, the question of relocating businesses. That's not a simple process. Um, and I watched the printing sector. Uh, there were attempts to relocate the printing sector from Manhattan into Queens and into Brooklyn, and I was directly involved in that process, trying to help companies find space and trying to help them move their machinery. Um, and I've also been involved in discussions on other sectors that uh, would be literally picked up and moved somewhere else. I can't speak about the auto repair industry. I don't, I don't know the issues related to that industry, but moving an industry is a very complicated issue and when you look at the job loss that's involved um, in the last 10 years in New York City in the industrial sector, a lot of that loss happened when people were pushed out. And that's the reality. Some of them probably would have gone out of business anyway, but others died in the process of being pushed out. Um, the one other thing that might, this might be the right time to add on the question of Willett's point that I think is interesting is it's a, it looks like a significant amount of space um, with some strong environmental issues, and I wonder if it might be worth it from the city's perspective to look at some of it for industrial use. Um, and that ties into a bigger question about what is the industrial strategy for the city of New York, uh, which is where I kind of, where you know, really where I want to, I want to finish up, um, because I think I've been a critic of the Bloomberg administration many times, but. They have also done things that have been, I think, actually very useful. And one of the most valuable things that the Bloomberg administration done, that did that I think is really important is they created industrial business zones. They mapped out the entire city and they selected areas where they thought it made sense to maintain industrial activity. And then they drew lines around those zones. And there were arguments about where the lines were drawn and who was included and who wasn't, but at this point, what we have is we have a whole framework that has state legislation, and that's an invaluable tool. And that, I think, should be a focus for the industrial community overall, um, including the folks at Willits, Willits Point. They might want to look at where the industrial business zones are today. They might want to think about, is there a role for them in one of those zones? But that's a very important tool that um, is going to be part of the future of the industrial community broadly defined, which is light manufacturing and then also other types of heavy manufacturing like we're talking about today. Um, the other thing that the city did, and this really goes to the final point about creating a strategy, is the city created um, a mayor's office of industrial and manufacturing businesses. And this was a very important step um, in the right direction. The industrial sector in New York needed this, whether they were at 250,000 jobs or they were at 200,000 jobs. They needed um, an office that dealt specifically with the complicated issues that they had, but the contribution that they could make to the local economy. Um, that office is basically, it, does, it essentially does not exist anymore in any kind of practical way. 
And that office was very important in helping the industrial business zones actually come to life and serve the companies within the zones. And I think when we're talking about the future, when we're talking about life beyond Bloomberg, or even the last two years of the Bloomberg administration, um, we need to have uh, leadership within the administration that is far more uh, aggressive in terms of an actual industrial agenda. The person who ran the mayor's office of industry didn't have a commissioner level position. And this is important. There should be an industrial commissioner in the city of New York considering the relationships that all these companies have to the local economy. Um, the, there's a commissioner level position, for instance, for film and television. That's an important sector does not have the kind of jobs that compare, the number of jobs that compare to the industrial sector. And this ties into this question of an industrial strategy. Will we develop one once and for all for the city of New York? An industrial strategy is not just a list of initiatives, it's an actual set of economic objectives. And I don't think there's any time more than now that we need a set of economic objectives um, for the industrial sector broadly defined and Willett's point uh, really fits into that. Um, and the other thing that fits into this, uh, this is the last point, I promise. So I've said I've made the last point the last three times. Um, there's a question, I think, and you alluded to this, Tom, of democracy, of who actually has power in the whole, not only the whole land use process, but the whole process that's involved in creating economic policy in the city of New York. This might be a very interesting test case for what sort of power exists in terms of making land use and making economic decisions um, and who has that power. Because when you talk to manufacturers, when you talk to people who run industrial businesses, who create jobs, who have put roots down in communities, they'll tell you very clearly that they, at the end of the day, know they have no voice at the table when decisions are being made. And the question is, how will they get a voice? Um, and that's a challenge for the next administration, and I think the Bloomberg administration could do something even with that challenge over the next two years. Um, but it's, it's very much worthwhile considering what's at stake. Two, two trajectories here, and I'm not sure uh, where this, where they're going to end up, if anywhere, <laughs> tonight. But um, we'll try, and then we'll. Uh, I think we'll. I think I should let the first two speakers respond to a you know pretty, pretty uh, directed critique, and then and then probably have a discussion more with the audience. Uh, I certainly have my own questions, but I think you should join in. There, there'll be some uh, wine outside, so we can always uh, settle things out out, with the <laughs> out in the real world uh, outside the door. But anyway, uh, uh, Neil or Tom, do you want to? I, I, I guess I'll be brief. I, I don't want to get into a point counterpoint. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I do want to make two uh, broad points here. Uh, I, a, a setting aside, I, I, I think it's unfortunate to, you know, um, that that uh, it's difficult to look at uh, these challenging uh, uh, planning efforts a little bit dispassionately. But the two points that I want to make are just around, specific to Willett's point around process um, and who has or hasn't had a seat at the table. Um, I would, uh, I, would, I would strongly argue that, that the plan that uh, we've been advancing is the result of very extensive community involvement and participation and that opportunities for input involvement have been afforded throughout that process, um, both informally uh, through community meetings and planning uh, initiatives. The Flushing Framework is a good example of that and then through the formal Euler process, which um, for, for a long time now has been the definitive <coughs> process for community involvement. And then secondly, um, I would just uh, 
counter strongly that somehow um, the plan was created as a result of a backroom relationship with developers. This was a public plan that resulted from a community process. Um, we developed a plan that looked to meet the needs of Queens and the city, uh, one that uh, was feasible um, and one that met broad economic goals. And we looked to the development community to help us implement that. And then shifting gears to industrial, um, I, I think um, that's really a subject for a whole other meeting that I think you could have. Uh, I think that's it's a, a, a much a broader dialogue that you could have. I would, um, Sarah alluded to it, but I would point you to uh, the initiatives that we rolled out uh, the city rolled out with EDC's help earlier this year, aimed at supporting and growing the industrial sector, industrial NYC, you can find it on EDC's website and we're in the process of rolling that out. Um, <laughs> and I would, uh, I would acknowledge that there's been a uh, change in perspective through the early part of the administration to now. Um, the focus uh, is very much on diversity and very much on supporting the industrial sector. And uh, I think there's lots of places around the city that we can point to uh, where we're doing just that. Okay, Neil, do you have a, um, want a word or two on? Uh, maybe very quickly, you know, and first of all, I very much appreciate uh, Tom and Tom and Sarah's comments and, and I just wanna thank you for the comments. Um, I think it was a very interesting discussion. And, um, you know, I, I, I do want to echo what Tom said about um, this being a process that grew out of a very intensive uh, input process and community process that, that happens in New York when you go through a ULERP. And, and also just echo that this is very much not, you know, a plan that's been dictated by developers and, and, and what they want to do. I mean, it, ha it has to be a functional, feasible development, but this is very much the city deciding to take on uh, the challenge of deciding what the what the principles and what the plan and the concepts and all the way down to the details of urban design uh, really should be for this site and to take that through this public process and so um, uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, a far better result because of that um, than if this was sort of left to uh, potentially a development that might uh, be realizing a shorter term vision uh, you know I think the site would be used much less efficiently. Uh, it'd be focused on certain uses. Uh, there'd be a lot more parking. Um, it'd be a lot less attractive in a lot of ways. And, and I think that the city has really um, made an immense effort to focus on the quality of this project, especially in an outer borough um, where that can be so hard to achieve and where the economics are so difficult. Um, I think the quality of this project as, a, as an urban community uh, is going to be uh, amazing. And, and I think um, you know the other general point, and uh, Tom had a uh, number of concerns about the urban surroundings and the challenges to a successful resulting community and a resulting urban design here. And I think that <laughs> as an urban designer and as an architect, you've got to be, we all are um, fundamentally optimists, um, but also if, um, if the highways and the bike lanes and the access to transit and all of the challenges of this site um, were going to uh, prevent it from being successful, then I think half of New York would not be successful because New York is in a way, you know, made up of all these incredible neighborhoods where people live in the most unlikely places. I mean, you look at a place like Dumbo, you go to Brooklyn Bridge Park, you know, the noise levels there are incredible, probably much, much higher than we're going to experience here. Uh, and yet it's one of the most desirable and attractive neighborhoods in New York. And I think that's the magic of New York is that we overcome these obstacles and, and we create these, uh, these amazing neighborhoods in the most unlikely of places. And, um, and I think that it takes ingenuity and you have to do two things. You have to connect it to the surroundings, you have to overcome these barriers, and you have to create a sense of community and the, the density, the number of residents. Uh, and you know, phase one is a step. You know, no nine million square foot project happens in one go. Uh, that is the opposite of Jane Jacobs' vision of urbanism. And uh, you know, this isn't, um, a place that will um, happen over, you know, a century with that kind of super fine-grained 
organic development, but, uh, but because it is phased, it is going to evolve over time. And I think you know, the idea of the urban design and of the rezoning is to create a framework for, for somewhat gradual development that will allow this to kind of grow into a community uh, over time. And, and initially, it's gonna, it's gonna be a little lonely there. Um, but then I think gradually it will evolve into, a, into an amazing community. I mean, I, I think we should open it up for questions. I, I just have one very general question, not to anybody in particular, but uh, it did resonate with me. I think you, one of you said that this was, in effect, competing with the suburban side of the frontier, <laughs> which is, of course, a, a very important consideration. On, on the other hand, I'm, I'm wondering, well, will that industry, which does seem to have a certain vitality, uh, you know, jump to the other side? I mean, where, where is this going to all end up? I mean, what's the, the end game for the, for the auto recycling in, or, or in general for the New York waste industry and, and these sort of space consumptive, uh, you know, uses that, that, that are still going to be needed, presumably? Uh, so I think there's, at, at least in terms of the discussion we've had tonight, there is this big que you know, question hanging over the whole thing, uh, Willis Point or not or wherever, uh, about the, that critical piece of, of infrastructure for the city. Um, you know, I'm reminded, you know, we've worked in, then I'll stop, but we, you know, we worked in um, Mumbai for a, a couple of years with students in a studio, and, and one year in Dharavi, which is a million people, informal, so-called, whatever. But of course, is handling, you know, a huge piece of the the waste processing of the city. So, so there's, you know, there's a, an ongoing debate there about highest possible use and what you know. But but there, there's a probably even more than here, really a critical piece of infrastructure represented in that community, for which the development models somehow, you know, somehow drops out of the discussion and you have, of course, valuable real estate and, and uh, you know, far more valuable than Willits Point probably because of the centrality. So you have, you have this, you know, this tendency to want to develop it further but without the accountability in terms of, of the, you know, total functioning of the city and the, the, um, the infrastructure of the city. So I, I see many parallels there and, and probably this points to the interesting notion that cities have more to say to each other than countries. <laughs> uh, you know, we could easily pick up this discussion in, in many places. Speaking of which, why don't we pick it up in, in our audience? Um, questions, thoughts, uh, before we adjourn for the final drink? Uh, two questions. Uh, one is the market economics of having a convention center in the far outer corner of the site, and also the market economics of being in a uh, low glide path. I think it's on the landing portion where you have maximum noise because of your Louverture Dam, and uh, and just the economics of wanting to buy in that under that circumstance. Just the. I guess to take the first question, on the convention center, um, yes, uh, as with virtually all convention centers, they, they typically require a subsidy uh, to operate. The vision um, with the convention center is that they generate jobs and a lot of ac uh, economic development activity, um, and they, they are typically argued in favor of for that broader benefit that they provide. Um, in terms of the specific location, um, it's uh, you know th it's a it's a land it's a flight path for LaGuardia, which is you know not right there, so the the planes aren't flying extremely low, um, but that actually made it a good spot because of the height restrictions. And a typical convention center is uh, you know uh, is not a high uh, height structure. on the noise issue? Uh, again, I, I think I would go back to Neil's point. I think that there's plenty of places you can point to around the city that uh, are not a, you know, a perfect location. 
Um, <laughs> residents in New York adapt. It's a great location. It's, accept it's, it's accessible. It's going to be a, a vibrant area. Um, you know, the, I don't think the noise here and the studies that we've done are going to be that different from other areas. Uh, that have that, that kind of conditions, and there are those, as, as, as Neil pointed to, such as Brooklyn Bridge Park. So we have a couple questions here. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, I think it would be helpful to the audience from the perspective of the EDC if you sort of explained where some of these numbers came from. Because it would, I think, um, strengthen the argument that there was good reason why a certain kind of rezoning was done here that could allow a certain kind of development instead of perhaps going in the direction where some of the critiques were coming from, which had to do with um, industrial jobs or uh, densifying what was already a complex, um, if not a full cluster, at least a concentration of certain kinds of jobs. And I think the numbers I saw were 15,000 construction jobs and about 5,800 or so permanent jobs. I'm not sure if I got the numbers right. That's right. But if you focused on what actually had been at Willett's Point, um, and although there weren't a huge number of jobs, if you had built that out, I could easily see a scenario where the number of permanent jobs would at least mimic uh, the numbers uh, that, that are being proposed here. And I could see also through infrastructure developments to build out an industrial cluster that you might be able to at least um, reflect a similar number of construction jobs. So even kind of a sort of a similar mechanics, I guess I was just trying to get a sense of where at you know, sort of what stages of discussion um, the EDC or the city at large decided to set aside those. And I think that would be very helpful for the audience to know. Um, I'll, I'll try to address it. Um, I think um, f 
from a jobs perspective, uh, by our count, um, there's about 1,700 or so total jobs located across the district. Um, those, the quality of those jobs and the types of those jobs are uh, very varying from um, union on one end to undocumented, off the books, um, rough work on the other end. So I wouldn't think of this as a, you know, a, a single block of a single type of quality industrial employment, because it's not. Um, and, whether, and whether that, uh, we didn't look at whether that could be grown. I, mean, I think as Tom noted, there isn't actually a lot of vacant land here. It is, it is utilized. Um, we did look at uh, what, uh, what would necessitate, what sort of economic development uh, uh, we would need on this site to meet the needs of Queens, and that sort of gets, I think, to your programmatic question. You know, how much housing do you need to begin to kind of have a, uh, you know, a, a sense of place here? What scale of uh, retail and commercial do you need to both create a place and um, compete better with surrounding areas? Uh, what sort of development and what scale of development do you need to help finance some of the costs that will be incurred when the site gets redevelopment, gets redeveloped, cleaning up the environment, providing on-site infrastructure. Um, so we did look at it very broadly in that way and sought to develop a mix of uses that would be complementary and um, dense enough to establish a place here. Um, and when we looked at that full mix of uses, uh, the job generation is what you indicated. Um, uh, we, f we think that this is, it will be job intensive. Um, it will be a complementary mix of uses. It will establish a new place. It will create jobs for Queens. It will allow New York to compete better with the outer boroughs. It will create significantly higher tax revenue. Um, so we did look across the board here um, and what, what was necessary for a development to achieve. Um, and we think that that, in order for the, to, to meet the constraints and the requirements of this site, a significantly dense development is required. Yeah. Can, can um, I just really raise the, the real question, which I think was suggested, that really the scenario of growing the existing industrial area was not on the table, was never on the table. And that gets to the problem with the process. If you start out by saying, we need to have a major new development here, uh, new construction, new development, new uses, uh, and we're, we're gonna talk to you, the community, and have a discussion with you, which is what they did, over and over again, many meetings. I went to some of those meetings. But once you've got the gun on the table that says, we're gonna take your property, we have the power to take your property. There are no meaningful discussions about the scenario of uh, saving the existing uses, transforming them. Yes, there's no vacant land, but uh, there are a lot of one and two story buildings that could be rebuilt, uh, built on top of, uh, redeveloped. There are many possible scenarios that were never explored uh, to you know, expand the existing uses. Could have doubled, tripled the existing jobs and reached the magic number of 10,000. Okay, maybe Any one more question or two. <coughs> here's, here's one and here's one. Two more. Then we can discuss it outside. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. I'm a UP student here. So I've got two questions. First, the bridge that you talked about linking the park with the marina. I didn't see any kind of protection from the wind, and I've walked that bridge in winter, actually like around this, in summer even, and once it gets cold, that's some very high winds. 
any kind of mitigation going on there? Because I just wonder if anyone would want to make that walk, make that commute, if they're exposed to the elements, even if you put the new development. My second question is, um, more importantly, what kind of thought did EDC, the city, the developers give to other sites? I know you talk about improving, making New York City and Queens more competitive. I just, there, uh, I believe there would be other venues in New York City, in Queens, where you wouldn't have to have all the costs for the infrastructure, where you can build in the retail and the residential without all the costs of getting rid of industry. And also looking at Long Island City, you have this new development where you have no retail. So what other venues did the city look at prior to just trying to do this major project? Well, I guess on your first question, I, I, I think you're <coughs> referring to the, the Passerelle or another, another bridge? parking lot to the marina. Right. Um, the, the MTA is looking at improvements to it. I'm not sure if they're looking at wind-related improvements. That's the, the first time I've heard that one. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a transverse that was built for the 61 World's Fair, so I, no doubt it needs some improvements. But I think Neil's point was there is a access way um, to link the site into a whole diversity of activities. But, you know, we'll certainly follow up on that. We hadn't heard the wind issue before. Um, your second question about did we look at other areas, uh, I mean, we, the city and EDC have initiatives all over Queens and all around the city in Jamaica and Long Island City um, in downtown Flushing with different goals. I think, uh, what we were trying to achieve here uh, was really yes to to uh, to kind of create economic development on this site in this district, but also to to deal with a, a problematic site. So it wasn't really just strictly looking at you know how do we satisfy um, the needs, but also what do we need to do to deal with this problematic site, to deal with the environmental problems, to deal with the infrastructure problems. Um, and what investments are necessary to achieve those goals. I think a wind protection for the passerelle would be a really awesome idea for a kind of an environmental design project. Could I add one comment? Mm, sure. Just about yeah. the... Uh, Maybe we have one comment and then another question will... I'll make then this we'll very deal. brief. The, and there's people in this room who know a lot more about the Euler process than I do. Um, but I think it's worth noting that the Euler process actually has no point within it where a community gets to say yes or no and that vote matters. Now the community can make all sorts of input and manufacturers, for example, often write letters, they testify, they participate, and then a community board can have all sorts of opinions and ask questions. But even the community board's vote on the project is non-binding. <laughs> So I don't know what happened with the community board in this case, but that has been a perpetual dilemma in the past in these rezonings, is that there's a massive gulf between the collection of information from the community and the feedback from the community, and then the plan that ends up being the one that gets voted on by the city council, department of city, plan or city planning commission, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I want to respond to that one, sorry. I, I, in my experience, I haven't seen that. I've seen um, that, uh, yes, under Euler, mm -hmm. the community board vote and action is a recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen is that that doesn't matter that much. That um, when, you, when you get to the point, the final step in Euler is the council, and when that council, all politics are local, and when that council person uh, is thinking about his decision on a project, he's thinking about to the community board and the recommendation that they made. So are there instances where um, the, the council uh, goes in a direction opposite to the community board? Sure, but I would say by and large, um, that position from the board is taken very seriously. And in the case of Willett's Point, the community board voted in favor of the project. One more, yeah, in the back. I have one question, um, kind of a broad question, but 
my question is, what really keeps this from being simply a, a transfer of wealth? I mean, I've seen uh, the projected conceptual plans, uh, and the most specific part of that plan is a 2.1 million square feet of development um, square footage. And on the other side, I'm seeing uh, 2,500 existing jobs and kind of the statistics of the community and the diversity of the economy. Now, if it's a, is it really just a transfer from one type of wealth that may break down into community, into economy, into uh, living, to uh, another kind of class or segment that can better off, you know, yield profit from 2.1 million square foot of development? It's a broader discussion, but um, <laughs> I, I would just note that um, that uh, the private development is used constantly to achieve public goals. Um, and that the idea is that there are broader public benefits, even though that there's a private participation, that there are broader public benefits that come out of a project. And we argue that very strong here. Yes, there'll be a private developer or a development team that'll involve you know, a lot of consultants and a you know, a lot of expertise, but the ultimate <coughs> benefactor are people, uh, jobs, the city of New York, tax revenue. Um, and that's how you have to look at it, uh, that the, the private development is achieving a public good. Well, you have to say that because uh, that's how you're promoting it as a public project, but um, there's, I mean, there's a fundamental disagreement about who benefits over this project. Just by saying it's, it's in the public interest, which is, by the way, Robert Moses' mantra, um, doesn't make it so. So there are con competing private interests here. A group of small business owners, property owners, and workers facing a, a small group of corporations who are the only ones who can afford to bid on this project and, and benefit from it, and who are taking advantage of the decades of hard work and struggle of the, 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 the industries that stayed there, despite the fact that the city cut off services, didn't provide services for them, and just collected their taxes. Okay, to be continued <laughs> on outside. But I want to really thank all of you. I mean, this is obviously a challenged and rather difficult discussion, but exactly what I think is needed in a university, and uh, I think um, deportment has been quite good considering the divergence of views. Uh, let's have a drink and uh, continue more informally. Thank you.